and Nature Revisited, the podcast. My name is Stefan Van Norden. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate our 100th episode. On this edition, we are featuring Stephen Hawley and his book, Cracked, The Future of Dams in a Hot, Chaotic World. But first, a few words from a few of my closest friends and biggest supporters who wanted to share in the celebration. Hello, my name is Jonathan Siegel. I've been both a guest and a sponsor of Nature Revisited, which is why I'm so pleased to be part of this occasion marking the 100th episode of the podcast. Truly an achievement to be proud of. This is really a milestone for Stefan, who in a few short years has hosted a truly impressive roster of guests. Since its inception, Nature Revisited has covered topics as varied as the importance of black landscapes, the role of wood in the rise and fall of civilizations, and the sheer wonder inspired by creatures as exotic and fantastical as dragonflies and hummingbirds. As someone with a serious case of wanderlust, it's been particularly fascinating for me to hear about the crucial role that nature plays in the culture of indigenous peoples worldwide, and I look forward to learning more about this subject in future episodes. I hope you'll join me in congratulating Stefan and his co-producer, Charles Gagan, on this momentous occasion. And if you value the unique insights and thought-provoking perspectives that Nature Revisited offers, I hope you'll spread the word about this very special podcast. Here's to another 100 episodes of Nature Revisited. Stefan, congratulations on making your 100th podcast and counting. I've known you as a close friend for over 50 years, and I know well that you love to talk. In the last few years, most especially about the need for a radical change in the ways humans think about and interact with nature. But the thing that perhaps most impresses me about your podcast is how little talking you do. What a consummately great listener you are. The philosopher Martin Heidegger wrote that true discourse is listening. And Confucius is recorded as saying that a wise man seldom has much to say. Your podcast exhibits a Confucian wisdom and a Heideggerian practice of authentic discourse. You don't bring an agenda to your interviews. You don't tell people what you want them to say or talk about. You ask questions and then your voice recedes so that you and we too can just listen can hear what the really interesting and diverse cast of characters that you've sought out have to say in their own way. We hear their voices, their stories, their perspectives, and what voices we've heard. Thank you. Hello and welcome. This 100th episode of Nature Revisited marks a real milestone in the journey of the podcast, and I'm glad you're here to help celebrate this auspicious occasion. My name is Jamie Horton. I've been listening to Nature Revisited since its inception. In its early development, the podcast was more about gardens and other aspects of the natural world and the reinvestigation of our vital relationship to them. As Stefan reminded us, and still reminds us regularly, we are nature. Get back to nature, revisit it, trust it, learn to partner with it. But inherent in this earlier work was also the metaphor of the greater garden, our earth, that we as human beings have so seriously neglected. And Stefan's podcast grew to address more directly the crucial challenges that we face if we are to become better stewards of this planet. What can, what should we be doing? Stefan's wide-ranging guests on Nature Revisited address this question from a myriad of perspectives, which makes for a really exceptional listening experience. 
The themes of Stefan's interviews have been the subject of many a conversation on walks in nature that he and I have taken over the past few years. His podcast is a place for dialogue, for exploration, for discovery, for recommitment. My wife Nancy and I continue to be proud supporters of Nature Revisited. We salute Stefan's first 100 episodes and are eager to follow whatever path he chooses for the next 100. Thank you for such wonderful words and for being here to help me celebrate. I truly appreciate it. And now, a few words from our sponsors, Bird and Company from Portland, Maine, and Prairie Restorations from Princeton, Minnesota. Bird & Co. is honored to be sponsoring the 100th episode of Nature Revisited with Stephen Hawley, Cracked, the Future of Dams. Located in Portland, Maine, Bird & Co. has been serving the best tacos in Portland for over four years. You can visit us at 539 Deering Ave or have us cater your next large event, whether that be a wedding, graduation, rehearsal dinner, or family gathering. As part of a larger community, Bird & Co. would like to encourage everyone to support the wonderful work that Nature Revisited is doing to help shape our future on this planet. Maine is no stranger to the issue of dam removal and its success. To learn more about Bird & Co., please visit our website, thebirdandco.com. Prairie Restorations is excited to sponsor today's episode of Nature Revisited. Founded in 1977 as one of the first native garden centers in the country, Prairie Restorations has grown and expanded the diversity of our native plants and services. Our mission is to produce and provide the most ecologically appropriate seeds, plants, products, and services to restore and manage native plant communities. Shop our online garden center and receive 10% off your order when you use promo code Nature Revisited. Be the change. Be a native gardener and help restore critical native habitat. Visit prairieresto.com to shop the highest quality native seeds and plants. That's prairieresto.com. Again, that's prairieresto.com. Now back to your show. Anyone who has spent any time in the woods, playing in a brook or a stream, has at some point tried to build a dam. I remember many hot summer days when I was young, when I would try to dam a stream, trying to create a swimming hole that was deep enough to jump in. Sometimes I would succeed, but only temporarily. Every dam that I ever built on that stream would eventually succumb to the spirit of the water. I learned at a young age that brooks, streams, and rivers do not like to be dammed. So Stephen, when I learned about your new book, Cracked, the future of dams in a hot, chaotic world, I knew I wanted to feature you and a book on the podcast. So thank you for joining me for Nature Revisited's 100th episode. Stefan, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So let's start with you. Are you originally from the Pacific Northwest? I am. I grew up in East Portland, Oregon, within a bike ride or a short car ride of some really wonderful steelhead and salmon rivers was lucky enough to befriend some folks that showed me the magic of those rivers. That was my initiation in, into that world. I loved your description of how your dams would be overtaken by the spirit of the water. I, I think that happens to all of us who are lucky enough to grow up where there's a healthy stream nearby. So when did you personally become interested in dams? And is there a personal connection for you? 
Sure. You know, my parents encouraged me and, and my siblings to imagine a world that we wanted to live in. And after being exposed to those wonderful salmon and steelhead streams I talked about earlier, I realized that dams were not that world and that there was a whole lot of beauty and a whole lot of fecundity and all those wonderful things that we seek in nature that weren't weren't being fulfilled because the dams were keeping them from keeping the rivers essentially from being themselves. So that was the personal connection. And I think that's kind of what led to the writing of the book. I really would encourage your listeners and the folks that pick up the book. This is really a book about creating a world that we think ought to be rather than settling for the world of what is. So as a journalist, when did you first start to investigate the real impact that dams have and why? Yeah, I came I came to this issue in kind of a roundabout way. My first assignment as a journalist, I had a friend who was a bit of a fast talker and he had talked to a, a publisher into letting him edit a commercial fishing magazine called The Fisherman's News up in Seattle. So he called me up and said, you got to help me out because I really don't know anything about this topic at all. <laughs> and I'll let you freelance as much as you want. So I did. And the first series of stories I wrote were about these commercial fishermen who had gotten involved in the management and, and policy decisions on dams. They rightfully figured out that the reason that they were having to cut back their harvest was not because of anything they were doing wrong. It was because the dams, as they pointed out to me, much to my shock and dismay, were responsible for taking up to 80% of the fish that came, came out of the Columbia River system, which is my home watershed. So that, that was an interesting statistic to me. And it was interesting, too, that they became active. Uh, it was maybe back then an unlikely constituency for conservation. But the two formed a strategic partnership, some conservation groups and these commercial fishing groups. And they started to push back on the idea that all of our rivers here in the Pacific Northwest should be given over wholesale to the production of hydropower or irrigation, that there's actually a higher purpose for rivers, and we should be managing them for that higher purpose as well. Can you give us a brief history of how dams became so prominent after the Civil War and continue to be built at such a rapid rate, right up to the present? This is such a fascinating story because it's also the story of the West. It's really the story of our country as well. And it's really a story of a quest to control nature, specifically control water. What happened is after a couple decades of trying, these very ambitious, starry-eyed promoters of turning the West into an irrigated Eden had pretty much failed. They didn't have the know-how. They didn't have the capital. They didn't have the expertise to control water in the West. So they turned to the federal government. A series of laws were passed. The first one was in 1902, and that created the Bureau of Reclamation. So how much of all things damned is political? Very little biology and a whole lot of politics going on with our water control systems. I'll give you a quick example. In the book, I write about the Westlands Water District, which is uh, in Southern California, short version of the story is that throughout the Obama and Trump administrations, the lobbyists for Westlands created an incredible deal for themselves where not only in an era of climate change and aridification and ongoing drought did they carve out water guarantees for their water district, but they also talked the federal government out of about $3 billion of publicly owned water infrastructure. They own it now. If you don't follow these kinds of things, you just ask yourself, what other branch of the federal government is in the business of turning over public property into to private hands and guaranteeing water in a extremely dry and volatile part of the country? It shows you the power of the political machine that agricultural and industrial lobbyists have made into our water infrastructure system. There's a long precedent to this, so it's not that they're doing anything new. It's just that they're getting better every year at what they do. So for most of us, 
the focus on dam removal has usually been around a conflict with fish, particularly Pacific salmon, and mostly in the Pacific Northwest. But as you so powerfully point out in your book, dams have been having a negative effect from the beginning. Why do you think the complete picture of dams has been so underreported? I think it's a, a, a tendency to cling to the narrative that we could control nature and even make it flourish with the technology that we deployed all over the American landscape in the 20th century. In this part of the world, there's a real reluctance to let go of the notion that all of the infrastructure that we put in this country after we won the Second World War as a kind of reward to ourselves did potentially more harm than good. That narrative is changing pretty quickly right now, though, just because of what's happening with climate change, what's happening with some emerging science around how polluting dams are. You're right, it has taken a long time to get to the the true nature of what a dam does to a river in terms of how that story is reported. The New York Times, LA Times, and Washington Post are all covering dam removals and controversies around water. I think perhaps the underreported story now is the effect that climate chaos is gonna have on our rapidly outdated water control systems. And I'll give you a couple examples. On the Colorado system, the second biggest water user in the whole Colorado River watershed is now evaporation. And this is actually true in a lot of desert river basins all over the world now, that when you store water behind a dam, the standard calculation rate in the 50s and 60s when these things were being built was that, well, okay, you lose about 10% of the water you're trying to store. Some researchers at the University of Colorado Boulder started looking into this and they discovered, no, that it's probably more like twice that. This starts to explain things like how the level at Lake Powell behind Glen Canyon Dam has dropped 140 feet since the year 2000. It's projected to continue to drop, and when it does, drops past the level that water flows through the intakes for the turbines, for the hydroelectric turbines, there is no way for the Colorado River to get around Glen Canyon Dam, which means that the 30 million people downstream of Glen Canyon that rely on the Colorado for their water are going to be in dire straits. There was just no anticipation that anything like that would ever happen when these structures were built. The assumption was it would always rain and snow enough in the Rockies to keep these big storage facilities full. You know, along those same lines, uh, Lake Powell is rapidly silting in. So when we do have a wet year like the one we're having, after a series of very dry years, you're moving as much silt and sediment as you are water. Because of that, the odds of Lake Powell ever refilling again to what we saw in the 70s and 80s is astronomically slim. So on that same line, talk about how dams are a methane problem. Yeah, this is a branch of science that's relatively new, but has been well researched and more data keeps coming to the table. I've been working with a researcher, a guy named John Harrison. He's on a team of scientists that has been studying this issue on a global scale. I believe it was last summer they published a paper that said that the world's reservoirs have a greenhouse gas footprint equivalent to the nation of Germany. The methane in reservoirs is produced when any kind of organic material, plant, tree, when it flows into the reservoir and decomposes anaerobically, it produces methane. And then that methane is released when the water pours over or through the dam. It's not the only way that methane is produced. It's when the level of the reservoir fluctuates and you get seasonal growth of plants around the edges, and then the next year, those plants are inundated uh, by rising water. That also produces methane. You know, and it's part of the mythology of dams. We've always told ourselves that the energy that we get from a hydroelectric facility is clean and green. Well, this, the science is really clear on this. This is not clean power. There was one 
seminal paper on this issue that estimated the greenhouse gas footprint of some of the dams in Brazil, which are relatively new, have the same footprint as a large coal-fired power plant. You know, this really should cause some scrutiny over places like China that are still having their own dam building frenzy. Before we move on, I'd like to go back to the reservoirs a little bit. A lot of us see these pictures of the West. Normally, they're huge reservoirs, and we just think that they're good things because they have all this water. Touch base on that again about how they're not really as useful as they kind of appear. Well, what we're doing when we add to the inventory of dams that we have is we're not really addressing the problem of scarcity with fresh water supplies. So if you look at some kind of innovative solutions to that, for instance, California is experimenting pretty widely with recharging aquifers and storing water underground so you don't have that evaporative loss or just much more efficient irrigation practices or growing less water-intensive crops. Those are all admirable things, but they don't really solve another set of problems that dams and reservoirs cause. We talked a little bit about siltation. You know, I was just down in Southern California looking at a dam east of Ventura up in a near little town called Ojai. And this dam was built in the late 40s. It was meant to be a storage dam. Big storm came through in the early 1960s and instantly rendered the reservoir useless because of the amount of silt that spilled into the reservoir. So now that dam has sat there for almost 50 years. It's going to cost about three times more to take this thing out than it did to build it, and it had a useful life of less than 20 years. You know, it's kind of the same story with any large dam on any river that has a significant sediment load in it. You look at the Colorado. The famous thing about the Colorado is it's too thin to plow, too thick to drink. So that's just a way of saying the Colorado, as the Spanish name suggests, is always full of silt and sediment. The other problem then at Lake Powell is that that reservoir is rapidly silting in. You see pictures of this place. It looks like there was never water there. It's completely silted in. And that is a process that's being accelerated by climate change because of evaporation and then in high water events, increased siltation. The Bureau of Reclamation, when they built that facility, they estimated that the reservoir would have a lifespan of 700 years. Some interesting science. I think what is happening with climate change is it's making that estimate into more science fiction. Let's talk about the cultural damage that dams have done over the years, not just to indigenous people, but to all of us who live near dams. The dam removal that kicked off the sort of modern dam removal movement, in my mind, was Edwards Dam on the Kennebec River in Maine. It's interesting to see what happened in the 20 years now since that dam was taken out. The architecture of that city had really created a scenario where the city literally had turned its back on the river. All of the buildings that had used the Kennebec as kind of an open sewer for industrial activities didn't really want to look at what the river was because it was filthy. Since the dam has come out, the city is starting to, its architecture is starting to turn to face the river. And I think this is a really powerful recovery narrative. You you asked me what the damage has been to all of us culturally. You know, when you have an entire city that doesn't want to look at what it's done to its river, that has a profound effect on people's desire to be there, on their own sense of what it means to be a human being trying to function in a, in a healthy and hopefully happy world. And they didn't have that in Augusta for many years. They're starting to have it now. And it has a positive effect on everything from tourism to the price of real estate to people's ability to quickly access a part of nature that is much better than it was when their kids maybe were there. That's the kind of story I think we really need in this day and age. One of the reasons I wrote this book is what I sent in talking to other adults and talking to my kids and their friends, that we're kind of experiencing a loss of faith in the ability of nature to heal itself. And part of that, too, is a loss of faith in the ability of humans to heal each other to heal what we've done to each other and to the, to the planet. 
when I look at 20 year long recovery from a dam removal project and see that people are coming to these spaces again, it's creating a tie to the landscape and a sense of pride and even, I would say, even joy. So how much of a global issue is dams and their construction and their removal? Where, besides the U.S., are some of the places where dams are having a major impact on the environment? Well, let's take a look at Europe first and foremost. Europe is kind of quickly getting into the swing of the dam removal craze. They removed in in EU countries over 300 dams last year. There's more on the docket. A really interesting story is in Albania, and there's a swath of territory that industrialization just kind of overlooked. There's a river called the Bielsa. We're getting closer and closer to having that whole watershed and a few of its tributaries protected. There was a plan to build over 3,000 low-head dams in this area as a way to, to increase power supply to kind of modernize the economy in these places. And there was a tremendous pushback from locals, but also just generally Europeans. They wanted to see that place set aside. That's a happy story. The, the less happy story is maybe what's happening in Asia in places like the Mekong. To a large degree, at the behest of the Chinese, but also the governments of Laos and Thailand, they're really engaging in a kind of heedless dam building frenzy that is a successor to the one that we took on in this country. It's unfortunate, as I wrote in the beginning of the book, it's taking away a reliable source of protein for millions of people who are still subsistence fishing out of the Mekong and its tributaries. We're seeing in these places is resistance to full-scale flooding of the river system that has provided so much food for so many people for millions of years. Because people are saying everywhere, this is this is the landscape that I've called home for a long time. If you take away the free flow of the water, you're basically taking away my life and my livelihood. Those are some of the stories I try to tell in the book. So are we still building dams in the U.S.? Not really. Not like they are in Asia, in China. We've removed over a thousand dams since the turn of the 21st century. You know, it's incredible when you look back and think about essentially Hoover Dam was built during the Depression, that massive structure they built for less than $50 million, which is mind boggling these days. The cost, both ecologically and economically, has become too great. So is there such a thing as a, a good dam? Well, honestly, I haven't seen one yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking out the window at my home river here at the Columbia. You think about what that river used to be. It used to be the world's largest producer of Chinook salmon. Somewhere between two and five million Chinook salmon every year came up the Columbia. And, and it was really for centuries, for thousands of years even, one of the world's richest marine ecosystems, you know, one that, one that stretched from the continental shelf to the continental divide. And what we did really without thinking about the consequences is we transformed that very quickly into one of the world's most productive hydroelectric rivers. If there's such a thing as a good dam, I suppose it would be taking a really hard look at a balance between those two superlatives, between hydroelectric rivers plugged with dams and one of the world's greatest producers of Chinook salmon. There has to be a balance in there somewhere. Part of the problem with trying to achieve that balance the way we have is we're not really looking at the true damage that big dam like, for instance, Grand Coulee can do. As soon as that uh, gates were closed on that dam, we lost a third of the spawning and rearing habitat in the Columbia Basin. And that was instantaneous. Those fish that spawned above that spot could never get back there. So in the book, you talk about the Glen Canyon Dam. Why is it important that the Glen Canyon Dam, which has been decommissioned, it's not even operating, but that it's really important that it be removed? It covered one of the most beautiful places on the continent, according to many people who saw it before the gates closed on Glen Canyon. In the book, I tell the story of David Brower, who was 
early Sierra Club activist, Brower successfully prevented some dams from being built in some really scenic places along the Colorado. But part of that bargaining was that he allowed Glen Canyon to be built. He agreed to not protest its construction, and he immediately regretted it. He was bitter about it for the rest of his life. I guess I don't share his bitterness, but when I see pictures of Glen Canyon filled with incredible hanging gardens, cliff walls that just framed a perfect azure sky, sculptures of water and rock that just boggle the mind when you see them. That's a loss. And people that experienced that loss mourned it the way they did maybe the loss of a loved one. Now we have an opportunity to bring that back. Brower wrote about that is that we should bring it back as a promise to future generations that we care about them. I can't think of a better way, honestly, to restore faith and loyalty to our landscape than to bring back a place like that. You know, there's a, there's a saying at the beginning of one of the chapters in the book on the Colorado by a river guide named Martin Litton. Martin was kind of the angel on David Brower's shoulder whispering in his ear to get him to stick to the sort of the highest possible values that he could win for the Colorado. Martin Litton said, don't ask for what is reasonable, ask for what is right. So is there a safety issue here as well when it comes to dams and reservoirs, particularly in the West? Is there a real threat of a major dam collapse that would be devastating for people as well as wildlife? Yeah, in the book I interview, uh, this guy's nickname is Dr. Doom. He's a retired professor of engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Investigated disasters all over the world, everything from the space shuttle Challenger explosion to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And he became kind of a renowned expert in systems of safety for every kind of endeavor you might imagine. What he found about the system of safety in place at Oroville and a lot of other dams so alarmed him that he stopped looking. Now, think about this. This is a guy that's investigated disasters of every kind all over the world, and he was so alarmed by the lack of protocols that he sees in the world of dams that he didn't, he didn't even want to look anymore. To me, that is a fairly startling indication that the odds of something horrible happening, especially in the cycles of extreme weather, is, is enough that we should be really concerned about it. So in the book, you have a chapter called Dam Removal 101. Can you share with us just a few pointers from that? Yeah, that chapter is definitely aimed at kind of the low-hanging fruit of dam removals, which is small dams that are plugging streams all over the place, but particularly on the East Coast, where there's just another century of industrialization that put a lot more dams on the landscape. And everybody agrees that a lot of these dams that exist, you know, up and down the eastern seaboard need to come out. And it's just a matter of finding the funding and jumping through all of the bureaucratic hoops. So that chapter is really about empowering local folks who see a structure that they don't want on their river to get rid of it. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the East Coast. The process, I think, applies just about everywhere, although there are different laws in all 50 states governing what you can and can't do on a stream. I did that because I feel like dam removal is also a fairly wonderful exercise in democracy. Because you're going to run into conflict, this process really brings a lot of people together to sort of look at and plan the future of water in their communities. I was talking with a friend recently about how important it is to, to try to get things to change on the local level. And I kind of feel like, especially with the death of the small town newspaper, that that's become a harder thing to do. And it may be if people can get excited about cleaning up a local creek or stream. That's one way we can sort of keep that communal spirit alive. The Colorado River, probably the most renowned river when it comes to dams. What does its future really look like? <laughs> yeah. Um, the future of the Colorado is dry, and all the climate models and predictions would seem to indicate that relying on the Colorado as it's presently configured and managed would be a radical mistake. It's still the case that in the Colorado, the largest user in that system is agriculture. And so on the one hand, it's great that 
people were cooperating to try to conserve water. On the other, the fact that an alfalfa grower can now ship that low-value crop to China, and because of that, they're being encouraged to grow more of it, we're still in the scenario where all the gains we make might be canceled out by concerns over how our farmers not just going to make a buck, but some of them, how are they going to make a killing? Really, the future of everyone who lives in the Colorado Basin is at stake when decisions like this are being made because there is absolutely no disagreement about the fact that the way things have been managed for the past 60 years simply won't work for the next 60 years. We'll, we'll create an even worse disaster than perhaps the one we're already looking at. So before we leave, can you share the wonderful story that you share in the book from New Zealand of the argument that local people used to oppose the building of a dam and the results of that argument. Sure. I love this story. It uh, took place in 2017. Some indigenous folks in New Zealand called the Wanganui Iwi. And they argued in court for what I term in the book fluvial personhood. And the basis of this argument is that if a, if a corporation, if a, basically a paper entity, can enjoy the same rights as an individual person, as was decided in our court system back in the late 19th century, if corporate personhood is real and something that is protected, well, then a natural system most definitely should enjoy those same rights. The Wanganui Iwi argued this in court and they won. New Zealand was the first place in the world where a river system now has legal rights and protections the same way that a corporation does. In my mind, kind of an extension of they're not only part of the river, they are the river. The river is them and they are the river. To have that kind of legal right bestowed upon the river that is their lifeblood and their identity meant a lot to them. They actually broke out into song in court on the day that that decision was made. And it's actually catalyzed a whole bunch of other similar court cases around the globe. It's a very intriguing legal argument that a natural system should be entitled to certain rights just as individuals are. Can you just give a few quick examples of how quickly and dramatically a river can restore faith in the cycles of nature? Uh, the best example I can think of is just about five miles as a crow flies from here. Just on the Washington side of the Columbia called the White Salmon. There used to be a dam on the White Salmon called the Condit Dam. A lot of folks, a lot of your listeners might have seen a clip of this dam removal because it was the dam sat in a narrow slot canyon. And so to take it out, they had to blow it up. They had to blow a hole in the bottom of it. Andy Mazur, who's a photographer for Nat Geo, he put a time-lapse camera on this event, and they blew a hole out of the bottom of Condit Dam, and the whole thing emptied out, you know, a matter of a day. And I tell you, when, when they did that, it was a mess, because you had 100 years. This dam had been in place for a century, and you had 100 years worth of sediment that had stacked up behind that dam, and it all came out at once. It looked bad. And it smelled bad. And I think some people were sort of privately wondering, boy, did we screw this up? Because this doesn't look like a recovery project right now. It looks like a natural disaster. Only a year after that dam came out, in what had been 80 feet of muck that had accumulated over a century, you had fall Chinook spawning in clear, fine river gravel. So over the course of the year, that river cleaned itself up and made itself presentable to its namesake fish. And I think there's, as the Wanganui Iwi would suggest, that healing is also reflected in people that get to witness it. And that's a powerful thing. And I, I think those are the kind of stories that I hope people will gravitate to that are in the book. We need not only a kind of intellectual type of loyalty to our homeland, but we need a, an emotional tie to what, the places that we live. And I can't think of a better way to do that than to start learning about and caring for the local waterway in your own neck of the woods. I hope you enjoyed this 
episode of Nature Revisited with Stephen Hawley, Cracked. I would like to extend a special thanks to Daniel Bertholdt, David Firm, Jamie Horton, and Jonathan Siegel for their continuing support of Nature Revisited. Thank you. When I first envisioned Nature Revisited some five years ago, I wanted to create a platform where I could share some of the voices of the many people who are engaged in making life on this planet better. I wanted Nature Revisited to be as diverse as nature itself. I believe that Nature Revisited is a place where one can find an amazing diversity of people, voices, and stories under one umbrella. From the beginning, Nature Revisited has extended its hand to all communities and people who are trying to shape a better relationship with nature, with our planet. Unfortunately, sometimes the survival of podcasts comes down to numbers, to subscribers, to how many people are listening. In the first five years, Nature Revisited has more than doubled its subscribers every year. And that growth continues. But there are over 8 billion people on this planet. And I want every one of them to be listening to Nature Revisited. So once again, I would like to ask you, my listeners, who enjoy the podcast, who sees its value, to please share Nature Revisited with family, friends, and colleagues, and to encourage all to join the Nature Revisited community. And I hope you will join me for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. Nature.